<coughs> couple of, couple of people still just wandering in. Um, welcome to the main committee room at Parliament House, Canberra. We meet here today where people have met for thousands of years, and I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, pay respect to the elders past and present, all, all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I'd like to welcome the Honourable Ken Wyatt, AM, Senator Patrick Dodson and Senator Malandiri McCarthy, who form our panel today. I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present in our audience today, and thank you for being here. Today's talk was originally planned as part of uh, the Parliament's NAIDOC week events, but had to be postponed due to circumstances beyond our control. It also occurs as part of a series of events planned uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Parliament House. I might mention the uh, open day for Parliament House on the 6th of October. Please feel free to come along to um, what is traditionally a um, very well attended and enjoyable event. Today's presentations look at our parliamentary processes from an Indigenous perspective, it provides the opportunity to reflect on the important work of in Indigenous parliamentarians here in Parliament House and beyond. Um, I'll introduce each of our speakers in turn and uh, at the end of uh, presentations from each of them we'll have um, uh, questions for the panel. Our first speaker is the Honourable Ken Wyatt, AM MP. Since 2010, Mr Wyatt has been the member for Hasluck, becoming the first Aboriginal member of the House of Representatives. In 2015, he was appointed Assistant Minister for Health, the first Indigenous member of Parliament to hold a ministerial position. Mr Wyatt is a proud Nunja, Tamachi and Wangai man and is currently the Minister for Aged Care and Indigenous Health. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Mr Wyatt to the lectern. I want to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the elders past and present. The journey into politics is the hardest. It's something that we don't consider. Uh, I look at Neville Bonner and the journey he had, and I got to know Neville in his later life, and I talked to him about the journey of travelling through into the political arena, and then as an Indigenous Australian, coping with the expectation that is often at a lower level, uh, that in terms of the engagement uh, within that role, but the interactions that you have with colleagues, and I talk about colleagues on both sides of the chamber, because in the work that you do, it's important that you influence. And that perspective is shaped from your childhood. When I first came in, I was asked the question of how are you finding the politics? And I said, let me tell you that the politics in our community is a great learning pathway. They are much more combative at times on issues. They are more challenging because it goes to personality-based issues. And I've seen some of our leaders who have done outstanding work still being criticised by individuals who've disagreed with their viewpoint. But in the journey in here, I made a comment that, and I want to reflect on two comments because this is important. One is I never thought as a 10-year-old skinny-ankled Nyunga kid living in a place called Corrigan that I would ever stand in the Australian Parliament. It wasn't in my thinking. It was also in a period in the 50s and 60s in which Australia was very different. And I never thought that I would ever be given a support of an electorate as an Indigenous Australian to hold a place in the House of Representatives. The second point was when I did my first speech, I looked around the chamber and I said, I stand as an equal. I came in the same way as you. I came and I occupy a seat. But the expectations that you know the systems that exist within this great place is inherent in your practice and in the way in which you do business and engage with people. I had an inkling of it because I worked for Ernie Bridger, the first Aboriginal man elected into the West Australian Parliament. 
And working with Ernie heading up the Aboriginal Lands Trust, I got a sense of the hours that you had to put in because Ernie expected us to be there at the crack of dawn and that we wouldn't finish until late in the night. So that part was to me a normal expectation of the system. The other pressure that we experience is that we have many constituents. I have a constituency of my own seat that I need to work through. And I had the constituency of the party that you belong to. And then my third constituency was the expectation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people because I happened to have been the first member in the House of Representatives. And so I was dealing with multiple layers and I would sometimes step on the toes of colleagues because I would undertake to do something on their behalf, although the ministerial responsibility resided with somebody else. And the challenge in that is that if we fail in the eyes of our people, then we are seen to lose some integrity for the issues that we fought for in the 50s and 60s, 70s and 80s. And I suppose in one sense, it's like those who come into this place who fight on particular issues and are elected on those issues. There is an expectation that you will deliver the reforms that you fight for outside of this place. But you soon learn that there are structures that you are required to adhere to. There are your own party processes, but there are processes within the House of Representatives that requires you to work with different parts of the workforce in this place in order to progress the work that you want to achieve. When I was once asked by Malcolm Turnbull on a flight when he was a backbencher what portfolios I would want, he said, it'd be natural for you to take Aboriginal affairs. And I said to him, no, because if you put me into Aboriginal affairs, I will only ever be seen by Australians of being capable of only dealing with those matters that relate to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I said, if I ever get the opportunity, I want a portfolio that is challenging, that is mainstream and that shows not only our people, but fellow Australians, that we have the capability and capacity to hold any position, to hold any role and to advocate on an issue outside of our portfolios of Indigenous affairs. The beauty is, today I present with a man I admire and respect, because Patrick is of a similar era that I was in. And in that journey, we've fought on many issues to do ex exclusively with our people. But when you're given a portfolio, you suddenly realise that you have a constraint within a team, that your portfolio becomes the focus of the work that you do. And that if the team makes a decision that you may not like personally, then you have to accept that as part of that team, you have to talk the message of your team. And ministers, in, given, in being given that responsibility, are given a great privilege. And when Malcolm Turnbull contacted me, I was on a flight between Sydney and Los Angeles, and I'd said to the woman who was sitting beside me, if I snore, just tap me on the shoulder and I'll stop. I said, my wife normally punches me, but I want you just to tap me. Halfway through, I was tapped on the shoulder several times and I opened my eyes and I sort of thought, I'm not snoring, what are you tapping me for? So I turned around and it was the purser. And she said to me, I have a message from the Prime Minister that you need to read. So I read the message and it was offering me Assistant Minister for Health. And she said he needs an answer immediately. And so I said, tell him emphatically, yes. She said, no, you have to write the words. So I wrote the words. But for me, the sudden realisation when I wrote those words was that as an Indigenous Australian, he gave me responsibility in a broad area. He didn't narrow the scope. And on that journey through in demonstrating that you have capability and capacity, he extended that eventually and said, 
I would like you to have aged care and Indigenous health. So I still got one of my favourite areas. But I also picked up on senior Australians. Now, because I've always fought for battles with fire in my belly and for issues in a way that you challenged the system, you challenged ministers, you challenged governments, I knew suddenly I would be challenged, the role had reversed. I would have to defend my decisions within the framework of government policy. I would have to curtail the way in which I could express some of the views that I might have on issues in a way that was part of being within a team. And in that journey, you learn so much, you learn to grow. But that knowledge and learning that you have is based on what your elders have taught you. Everything that I do has been shaped by my parents in the context of my culture, of Noongar culture, Yamaji, Yamaji heritage as well on my father's side, but also Wongai linkages. And the elders taught me that you listen first and you listen well. But you don't listen just with your ears, you listen with your eyes because you watch body language and facial expressions. And then you take into consideration that information and then you turn it into the wisdom that you need to give to the role that you have to play. You learn to be patient and you learn to be measured in the way in which you respond. I love the system we have in this country. I love the fact that we've got a democratic system that allows us the freedom to fight for those things in a way that is public, but also to influence. I know that my time within the coalition has shifted the thinking of many members. The way in which they turn their minds to the needs of Indigenous Australians within their electorates, because they come and talk to me. They'll come and say, can I have a politically incorrect discussion with you? Because they have the courage to be able to come to any one of the four of us and have those discussions. And it's been important in the way in which we've shaped the thinking of this parliament on all sides of the chamber. And whilst our colleagues mightn't agree with us, it still nevertheless allows us to use the systems that have been established. I think one of the strengths of this place are the committee structures. And I served on four committees when I was in here. And I enjoyed the Constitutional Recognition Committee and the Expert Panel Committee that I was on because it gave me the opportunity to acquire a better understanding of a lot of the challenges that we still face, not in terms of the big issues, but in terms of the nuanced issues at the local community level. And we still have much work to do in this nation, First, First Nations people, on every front of portfolio activity. That the changes that will come will be a benefit. But I also want to say that I have learnt to enjoy the interactions on so many issues, but the camaraderie of people on both sides of the chamber and the way in which we collectively, whilst we might agree philosophically on positions, will engage in conversations. And those conversations, in some instances, might be guarded but equally in Aboriginal health and aged care, I want to open dialogue so that we have a bipartisan approach on the issues that I have to tackle. So I've enjoyed the journey. I've enjoyed growing beyond the country kid that started at the age of 10, taking an interest in politics by listening to Question Time. I used to listen to Lou, uh, I think it was um, Lou Daly, not Lou Daly, Mr. Um, Fred Daly. And um, the Jim Killen, because I used to love listening to them debate each other. In question time, my parents couldn't understand why I would spend my time sitting in front of the radio. It was an old valve radio, listening to Parliament. But I'm glad that I did, because that shaped some of my thinking and the journey that I've taken. So I thank you for the privilege of being here with you. It's been great, and I look forward to 
some questions later on from all of you. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Senator Patrick Dodson. Senator Dodson is a Labor Senator for Western Australia and Shadow Assistant Minister for Indigenous Affairs and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. A Yaru man from Broome, he has been the Director of the Central and Kimberley Land, Land Councils and a Commissioner during the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Senator Dodson served as inaugural chair of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and as a co-chair of the expert panel for constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Please welcome Senator Dodson. <laughs> Uh, let me firstly acknowledge the uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and on whose lands we are all gathered and acknowledge the service that they provide constantly to this parliament and to many other venues around Canberra through their welcome to country. I express my appreciation to Matilda House in particular, knowing her over many years. I, I want to acknowledge my fellow parliamentarians here. Um, and I know that uh, Linda Burney uh, would have loved to have been here um, and uh, acknowledge that she's the first woman, first Aboriginal woman to be in the House of Representatives. So uh, that's a pretty mar a remarkable achievement amongst the many that she's made. Um, and I acknowledge all the First Nations leaders who are not politicians, but who have battled the system and the, and the uh, society's um, entrenched values that are harangued against First Nation interests. Uh, many of those over the years have fought long and hard to, uh, to get recognition for land rights, for better justice systems, for redress to uh, the social inequities that have taken place. So I acknowledge all of those people. And where they may have been deemed to have failed, uh, that's where the nexus between my relationship and theirs comes to this place because the parliament's where many of these things get decided, where policies of parties uh, get to uh, either endorse or become emphatic against uh, the interests of First Nations peoples. Um, one of the things I first noticed in this place uh, when I came, uh, and I'll come back to how I got here in a minute, but when I first came here, the use of language and uh, of course the introduction of Ken, uh, when he came in, the, the way in which he came in, dressed in a, a possum skin, and making it clear he was, a, he was a First Nations person, an Indigenous man, into this parliament. So those things, Melanderi herself and Linda, again made pretty clear statements about their, their connection and uh, their pride and their admiration of First Nations people, irrespective of the parties we belong to. And my um, challenge was the, uh, the use of uh, the, the simple language of the Yaru uh, in, the, um, in the Senate. And with the uh, concordance of the, of the President, I was able to engage with him uh, in a way that, uh, uh, in a limited way, at least got some of the Yaru language recorded in Hansard. Uh, now that's a challenge in this place, is to actually get Aboriginal languages, first languages, uh, recorded when we are in committees or when we're doing things uh, in an official capacity so that those first languages are given proper respect and, uh, and recognition and the use of interpreters, of course, in those situations. Uh, the, uh, there are many things I could say, but I'll go back to the start. I mean, I, I never had any aspirations, a bit like Ken, to uh, be in this place. I have no illusions about how effective I can be here. Uh, but I did come here uh, because of the uh, uh, particularly the women uh, in front of me. And uh, the, as you know, the uh, recognition this year of because of her I can. And I want to acknowledge, say, my grandmothers and my, my mother and my sister and those that uh, helped guide me along the way in my, in my earlier years. But I also want to acknowledge um, Louise Pratt, who's a senator today from Western Australia. And at the time of the uh, uh, the vacancy for this position that I now hold in Western Australia, one of our Labor senators had difficulty accepting the party platform on, um, on, on, a, on, a, on a moral matter. And so the vacancy arose and Bill Shorten rang me and said, uh, would you be interested? 
And I said, well, give me a couple of days and I'll think about it. Uh, but the other person that could have easily have protested and said that uh, she should be rightly considered was uh, Senator Louise Pratt. And I want to thank her for making the accommodation of my uh, ascent into this place uh, uh, possible as well. And, and that's how it works here. You, you have these amazing accommodations that can take place, as, as Ken has mentioned, across the party, but in, inside the party, uh, there are many, many accommodations. We, uh, we uh, try to help each other out as best we can, given the pressures we know that uh, most senators uh, uh, work, uh, work under. Uh, of course, Ken's in the other place, so we don't know what work they do down there. Um, <laughs> we know exactly what the senators are up against. <laughs> and, and that's being on committees, it's been long hours. Uh, uh, some of my early experiences was you know, sitting almost till dawn on some particular bill that the government felt absolutely imperative and needed to be passed. And so encountering sleep uh, apnea is, is, is a pretty much a hazard in this joint. Um, but the, the other thing is the values. Uh, you find that uh, I, I spoke of uh, a couple of three values, basically, the Yaru people have got. I spoke of Mabu Narangulinil, which is a good community. We all aspire for good communities, but this means at the, the essence that, um, of, our, of our capacity to live in a civil society, honouring the diversity and differences of others, is something that should be at the forefront of how we go about our politics. And I also spoke of Mabu Buru, which is respect for the land and having a good country. And so that goes to the environment, the connectivity of human beings to to the land and the sea, and how we exploit the resources of this nation uh, to sustain the quality of life we have, but also to make sure we don't overindulge ourselves with the privileges that we accord to ourselves, uh, the way we do use the resources. So the connectivity between us as humans and the environment is a very, very important factor. And in the Yaru people, how that balance is, is impacted impacts us as, as human beings as well. And the other, and that comes to the very point of what we call Mabu Lian, how we feel. Not just whether I feel touchy and feely, but in my innermost being. Now, the parliament doesn't operate on those sorts of issues, those sorts of values. Underneath it probably is, probably is in, in some general aspirational way. But we, we tend to operate on how we deal with legislation, how we deal with amendments to legislation, and then we, spend a fair bit of time trying to figure out when the government's going to get to a position of uh, agreement with the crossbenchers in the Senate in order for them to actually come in and do something serious rather than filibuster uh, on, 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 uh, on matters that uh, could have been done in a very short space of time rather than dragged out. So you notice that time uh, becomes a critical management factor in the place and you will notice that uh, so that also has an impact on your capacity to get good sleep uh, because it's not only the way the parliament operates in the Senate, but also the amount of legislation that goes through the Senate. Uh, and so you've got to try and uh, keep abreast a of the various pieces of legislation. Um, and if you're on duty in the Senate, obviously the ways in which the tactics of, the, of uh, progressing matters takes place as well. Now I got shanghai into here in the, in the, in the uh, period just before the double dissolution. So in the first week of my coming to the place, I had to get used to the routine, I had to get used to the bells, I had to get used to the, the way the parliament operated. And there no, there's no training courses here to help you grapple with any of that, particularly if you haven't been part of the machinery of a party. And I've never been a, a, a member of a party uh, until I joined the Labor Party to, to justify my existence here. Um, <laughs> but the, um, the, the importance of, of trying to keep abreast with everything is, is a really challenging factor, particularly when you've only got four staff and you're, you're trying to keep abreast of all of this stuff. Uh, and, and, if you, and, and if you get shanghai as I did, into an into a, um, assistant uh, sh shadow minister's position, which is pretty unusual, to assist the, uh, the leader, uh, uh, Mr Shorten, on Indigenous affairs. So you're dealing with those matters that 
the leader of your party who carries the portfolio, uh, you, you've got to try and keep up the, the pace. Contrary to, to Ken's position, uh, my focus has been within First Nations to a fair degree, um, and primarily around constitutional recognition. Uh, the outcomes from the Uluru uh, Statement. So how do we get some of these things now at the parliamentary level rather than at the consultation level, uh, which I've been a party to in, in the past, but how do we get these things politically adopted that is reflective of First Nations aspirations? So I find myself having to deal in a different context to one which I dealt with previously, where you could have a meeting with your, your Indigenous uh, uh, co-travellers, you can have your arguments, you have your disagreements, and you come to a consensus. And then you go off and you do battle with whomever you have to. Here, you've got to deal with your own party, and then you've got to deal with the people on the other, the other side, the government and the crossbenchers, and then you've got to get people to get to first base on the issue. That is, why shouldn't we have constitutional recognition in the, in the, par in the constitution of First Nations people? What's so complicated about it? What's so complicated about it is that I now co-chair a um, cross-party uh, inter-house committee that's been looking into this. Uh, Ken sat on one pr prior to me when uh, Senator Perris was here. And uh, we both sat on committees prior to that uh, when Julia Gillard was uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister on the expert panel. So <clears throat> our journey around this matter has been, uh, been long. So you find that not everyone's up to the same degree of background and history in terms of consciousness of the issue and the awareness. We've just come, uh, Senator McCarthy and I have just come from a hearing in, a, in one of the rooms down, down the hallway on uh, the CDP. Changes to that and the, the draconian penalty measures, in my view, that are applied for people who've breached these things. Four, four weeks without an income in, in a remote place, you're going to have to worry uh, how the hell people survive, how do they pay their rent, how do they feed their kids. So you end up with ideological issues that are embedded in legislation and uh, then you get questioned, of course, well, what the hell are you doing about it? Well, I've just come from a committee, we raised some questions. We are trying to work with the government or trying to move the government further. In opposition, it's very hard, but trying to move the government to a position where they might get back to something that the community uh, particularly wants to see, that is the old CDP type of, of, uh, of uh, welfare uh, application. So you might be doing that today, tomorrow. I could be on a select committee inquiring into something else, not just in the constitution. When I first came in here, I was put on a select committee and the select committee is usually chaired by the opposition. It's not chaired by the government. The government usually chairs these legislative ones when there's a piece of law. And so the select committee I got thrown onto first was to deal with a very, very complicated matter uh, with the, um, about Western Australian, the Western Australian uh, government repaying a loan to the Commonwealth and who was involved and, and what level and, and uh, whether there were certain uh, responsibilities attributable to the Attorney General at the time and, and other players. So you get focused in on a very political uh, matter which has uh, uh, all the walls go up, on, of course, by the government on, on those things. Um, and you find yourself caught up in a, um, a challenging space when you have, uh, you've got to get yourself up to speed on the historical background as well as the, the legal implications of these things. We're not being a lawyer, that's, that's always challenging. The, the question of delivery is always constantly at your, at your doorstep. Uh, it's particularly galling when you're in opposition, because it's, unless you get the collaboration with the minister or with the government on a particular issue, it's very hard to move things. People put uh, requests to you for language support programs, for cultural programs, for changes to uh, to work uh, work regimes, to improvement to uh, to um, conservation uh, preservation. The government's changed just recently a whole lot of regulations that related to. Uh, the marine estate, and uh, you know, what are you doing about it? Well, <laughs> okay, we're trying our best. We've got a shadow minister responsible for that, and we're trying to move uh, the the debates um, and question time and other places around topical issues. 
Uh, and you find yourself caught up with those things as well. Uh, and the other issue around is you have opportunity to speak in the house, in, in, the, in the chamber. The house is that other place. To, to speak in the chamber uh, where you can, then there are different times in the, in the time, uh, in the management of the uh, hourly, uh, uh, the, the daily horarium where you can say something. You have senator statements, you can comment on an MPI, you can ask questions, uh, you can interject, you can, you can do, um, um, you can be part of a debate uh, on a particular bill or you might have carriage of that particular bill. Uh, for instance, the Minister, we hope, one day will bring in this amendment to the Northern Territory Land Rights Act, which actually gives land back to people. So we can celebrate with the Minister the giving back of land. And I'll get up and say how wonderful he is for doing that. <coughs> but, you know, that's been sitting around for a number of years now. Uh, so we've got to get to the stage because the business of the Parliament gets rearranged by those that have got responsibility. Uh, the, um, and I'd better stop soon because I'll... Uh, cut out the time that Melendary gets. But um, I, I want to say just one last thing, I suppose. There are many things we can say about the place. It, it is an alien place when you first come here. Uh, you do make some friends, as uh, Ken has acknowledged, across the benches. Uh, when I first come in, came here, of course, the big populist view was whether I was going to wear my hat into the Senate. And uh, I'd never ever thought about not taking it off, but anyway. I went and saw the, um, the, um, the, the clerk and got some uh, advice and uh, you know, there used to be a tradition here where you had to put, a, put something on your head when you got up to talk. And so there's no rules in the Senate about wearing hats. And in fact, there is down the, in the other place, but um, in, in the Senate there's no rules. But because of the lunacy that you can get, and we saw with one particular individual in the Senate come in with a particular stunt. Um, I decided, well, I'd try to avoid those sorts of stunts um, by not wearing my hat in the Senate uh, by way of uh, my own choice. Uh, because it would just distract, really, from uh, the positive things that need to be done and the constructive things you want to do. So I elect now to leave my hat outside the Senate. And to the credit of the staff in this place, it's taken them 12 months to get me a little hat stand so I can put my hat on it. <laughs> <laughs> but they've got it for me, they've got it for me. This place, any alteration, any addition has got to be in the symmetry of the design of it. And a, a, a humble little hat stand caused such, a, such an uproar. But anyway, I have it now and I can uh, uh, express my appreciation to the staff uh, that made that happen. So happy to take questions and respond to other things, but I better let Madeline Derry have some, something to say. Thank you very much. Our final speaker today, Senator Malandiri McCarthy, is a Labor Senator for the Northern Territory. Senator McCarthy, a Yanua Garawa woman, is a former member of the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly. There's no stranger to public life, having worked as a journalist for the ABC, SBS and NITV. Senator McCarthy's focus is on bringing communities together and ensuring that the views of people in remote communities become a part of the national agenda. Could you please welcome Senator McCarthy? I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present and also to my fellow parliamentarians here. Um, it's just awesome, isn't it, really, when you think about uh, uh, the opportunity to work uh, beside uh, people with such uh, depth of experience, uh, not only in Aboriginal Island affairs in this country, but just in Australian life and to work beside um, Pat and Ken and also Linda and I do you know we do work uh, with each other in that regard because we as you've heard from the previous speakers that uh, we know that uh, at the end of the day the issues that face First Nations people in this country require a deeper responsibility uh, of this parliament in both the House and the Senate to effect change for the better not only just for First Nations people, but for our country, so that our country can stand proud uh, that we are making changes. I've got some vision, just 
flowing through because any opportunity I get to celebrate the Northern Territory, I like to do that. So please just, uh, you know, have a good look at uh, the vision and the images of the people and the places of the Northern Territory. I'm enormously proud uh, to represent the people of the Northern Territory and Christmas and Cocos Islands. So Christmas and Cocos Islands are also in the Northern Territory electorate and uh, uh, that's, that means a plane ride to these mob country over in WA to Perth and then across to the Indian Ocean, which is a fair, fair bit of travelling but they come under the Northern Territory uh, in terms of this parliament and representation. My story begins really with uh, the place called Borolula, which is a thousand kilometres thereabouts, southeast of Darwin, uh, in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And my people are the Yanua and Gadwa peoples, and we live alongside the Mara and Guranji peoples and clan groups. Uh, we are known as Lianta Wudiara, which means our spiritual origin comes from the sea country. And everything we do, and certainly everything I do, uh, comes back to that sense of self and identity and purpose. I was asked the other day about uh, what it's like to uh, be a politician. In fact, often get the question, do you enjoy being a politician? And I reflect on that question a fair bit at times because as First Nations people, I believe, and certainly as Yanua people in the Gulf region, we are born political because our situation uh, is of such disadvantage. Uh, we know that in order to change it, we have to always be active about trying to change it. For the Yanua, we spent 40 years in the first uh, Aboriginal land claim of the Northern Territory um, when the Land Rights Act came in in 1976. So my grandparents uh, were the ones who lodged the claim for the Yanua under the Northern Territory Aboriginal Land Rights Act. And that was after obviously the witnessing of Vincent Lingiari in Wave Hill and the need for First Nations peoples right across Australia who came and went to Wave Hill to support uh, the Gurindji. My family were part of that. And then when the Land Rights Act came in, we then submitted for recognition of our status. And for generations, we had been also trading with the Macassans, uh, Sulawesi, as part of seafaring people exchanging tools, exchanging ideas, exchanging family links. And that was recognised uh, only a couple of years ago in the federal court, the recognition of those trading rights, the international trading rights uh, that we have uh, historically in our region. All of this is about politics. And so the, the next step of uh, joining uh, the ALP in 2005 to represent the people of Arnhem Land was a very natural one for me in that regard. I felt that we had struggled as a Yanua people to uh, have our recognition and that took four decades before all the lands and the islands were returned for us to be able to set up our Leantha Wiriata Sea Rangers and it's the Sea Rangers who look after our country uh, the dugongs and sea turtles and the rivers and waterways and where we look at the jobs and that sense of strength of culture is there. So to progress into the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly and represent other clan groups, other language groups of Arnhem Land was important for me because I felt that for two reasons. One is that I wanted to give back. I felt that I had experienced a tremendous amount in my life that I wanted to see what we could do in terms of housing, education, health, and also to learn. I wanted to keep learning uh, because uh, we have so many First Nations groups in this country. And it was important to respect the fact that I didn't know, didn't know them uh, in that region. And so that was important for my learning and growth. And I think Ken mentioned that, that it's life's always about being open to the journey and the learning so representing the people of Arnhem Land and then into the Northern Territory Parliament was again um, 
interesting how the Parliament of the Northern Territory was trying to deal with the many uh, Indigenous people that were coming in uh, to represent. And then to have the opportunity to come here to the Senate was just uh, enormously humbling. I, um, you know, I, I certainly give uh, praise to our first Aboriginal woman senator in Nova Paris and the work that she did uh, for the first term when she was here and then to have the opportunity to come in. And what we're trying to do uh, in terms of the system of the, of the federal parliament is to actually look at the system look at the internal mechanisms. And I look at uh, the internal mechanisms of the Australian Labor Party. If we're supportive and want to see a voice of First Nations people to the parliament, we also have to be very clear about, well, what is the voice or voices that we have within our current system? So I look at our party structure and I think, well, if we want to uh, sell to the Australian people that this having a voice to the Australian Parliament is the way to go, then we also need to do it within our own teams, in our own organisations, in our own areas and state and territory jurisdictions. So in the Australian Labor Party, we established the First Nations Federal Labor Caucus. Why did we do that? We did that because we knew there needed to be First Nations input into legislation that impacts First Nations people in this country. So for two years, and that's how long I've been here, um, we've been working on that caucus and looking at pieces of legislation, dissecting issues that impact uh, with excruciating um, you know, interest. And what we do is we have that caucus. As it's not just Linda and Pat and I as the First Nations people in the federal uh, Labor caucus. It's actually open to our federal Labor members who either in seats that have a large Indigenous community or they just have a natural interest in wanting to understand better about First Nations people. So that's our caucus. And, and I'm very proud to say that we, we have a really consistent uh, group of people who come together, around 15 to 20 people, to look at pieces of legislation and issues impacting so that we can examine it and contribute uh, to the debate in a really responsible way and inclusive way. And that's uh, something that I see when I think of the theme of today in terms of the structure of the parliament. That's again, seems like a small part of change that we're, we're implementing and uh, influencing, but a very important part of change in the overall picture of what we're trying to do in Australia today. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and I'll uh, sit down now and see if we can have some questions to our panel. Thank you. Um, we do have a microphone here in the uh, middle of the room so if um, anyone would like to wander over and uh, ask a question that would be most welcome. I'll also um, uh, suggest you can either uh, direct a question to one of our panellists or to all, all three of our uh, panellists today. We have our first question. Um, thank you, Senators and members. This was wonderful. Um, I've been planning to come to the earlier version of this panel as well as this one, so thank you for making sure that it happened. My question is about the voice, and it's a natural follow-on to our last speaker. Um, I'm a new Australian, and you guys are a heck of a lot older Australians than I can even imagine from my own ancestry. And I honestly don't understand why the government fears so much allowing your voice to be heard. I think the Labor Caucus is a good way to implement in some way that voice, but I'm ignorant as a new Australian. Why, why is it the way it is? What is the fear? And what can we ordinary people, non-elected people do to help get the voice forward? Sure. Look, I th thank you for your question, and I might refer to my colleagues in that regard, especially with um, Ken in terms of the government's position on it. But um, I'll, I'll just go to the heart of, firstly, change 
change is uh, change is something that uh, moving people out of their comfort zone I think is probably a very simple response and I mean generally when I think when I reflect on some of the changes I've tried to influence even at a Northern Territory parliamentary level as well as now uh, the federal level and and trying to motivate influence and encourage that change uh, is is perhaps where we're at we certainly um, have needed to really get the messaging right that the request for a voice to the federal parliament was never about a third chamber of parliament and i think that that has been an unnecessary distraction in the debate and maybe helps reinforce those views of people who have not been open uh, to, to wanting to see this discussion. So I think I'm going to refer to Ken because I think it's probably more important that you hear from him on this regard. But certainly uh, I think people are aware of where the Australian Labor Party sits in terms of uh, wanting to see that happen. We are very, very um, supportive and want to see that uh, voice implemented here in the parliament. Let me just add to what Malandiri was talking about, I think one of the greatest fears is a, fa a fear of failing a referendum. The voice has always been an issue that we as Indigenous Australians <coughs> have talked about, whether it's in a portfolio area or in other major forums. And over the years, our voices have become much stronger on a raft of matters. But the recognition and the structure for a voice, if you don't know what it is defined as, will fail in the constitution. The constitutions are not readily, uh, constitutional change is not always readily accepted. And we look at the numbers that have failed over a period of time. And Patrick and Julian, as co-chairs, have got the uh, unenviable task of coming back with some solutions for the parliament to think about. Parliament is a reflection of Australian society. And when you talk about uh, indigenous issues in some quarters of Australia, there are some very strong opposing viewpoints. They are less now than what they were 30 years ago. And the debate that we need around this issue can be generated by fellow Australians as well. Because when people take charge, governments often respond. We saw that with the same sex debate that the movements around this nation saw a resulting discussion in both chambers and then ultimately a plebiscite and then ultimately legislation that addressed the issue. So we still have to have conversations with fellow Australians to say that it is not a threat. It is not a third chamber. It is about looking for solutions that give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a sense of having a say on many of the things that impact on them and for the historical uh, legacies of the past to be set aside and for us to look forward to a nation that is of two significant groups, that is fellow Australians and the First Nations people who've been here for 65,000 years. Okay. Well, we, we could probably be here all day uh, on this, but. Um, I think um, many people in the, the broader public want the parliament to get on and solve the problem. Uh, I think they're sick and tired of the discussion, quite frankly, and many First Nations people are obviously wanting that to happen. It is, as Ken says, it's, uh, you've got to negotiate your way through the parliamentary labyrinth, uh, particularly if you want to entrench a, uh, a head of power in the Constitution. It's a complicated system. If you're new to Australia, I think there's eight out of the 44. We've got to change the, our Constitution by a certain methodology called a, a referendum, which requires a majority of states and a majority of voters to actually agree to the proposition. <clears throat> and that's a fairly high burden and, and onerous. So the, the failure of that has downsides. Um, on the other hand, I think, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of hope that we can achieve this, that we can achieve it. I, I, I think um, I was at a little place in South Australia recently, at Alliston, where people knew in their hearts the story of a massacre that had happened back in 1849. 
folklore. It said, you know, the First Nations people knew about this. Some of the settler sons and daughters knew about this. No one was capable of getting it into the public space and where it could be discussed and argued about and considered. Now, they've come to terms with that. They've re-owned their space, those people. Not everyone's on site. But they did that through um, the work of trying to restore a coastal trail, a simple thing. And in the process, they discovered the Supreme Court rulings uh, back in 1849 that referred to this massacre. And then they said, what the hell are we going to do with this? And then gradually it became a discussion with some of those um, uh, First Nations people from that area and the non-Indigenous leaders coming to terms, having the arguments, having the debates, which now has a beautiful monument out there on that coastline, uh, about where the place people got into, thrown into the sea. So we are capable as a nation of move, moving forward. We are capable of being liberated by the truth being told. And the, the University of New South Wales done a marvellous job recently on identifying a number of uh, massacres um, around Australia. They haven't done anything in our state, in West Australia as yet, but we know of massacres that have taken place there. Um, but so there's a lot of information. And I, I think part of the fear is what people are going to sort of tease out and figure out, well, what are you frightened of? What, what are we, you know, you can see it in the early period of settlement. They're frightened of losing their investments, the cattle, the sheep, their, you know, their little paddocks and their independence because they were, you know, whether you had 10 acres or 50,000 acres, you're lord to your manor. And even the natives still posing a threat. So the threat and the fear go together. What are you, what are you fearing and what do you feel the threat about? And there's no threat, there's no fear because those people in Elliston are still getting on. In fact, there was a transformative experience for the First Nations people in that process of the recognition. So it's not just about the white guys having to change, it can be transformative for both. That this has been recognised, honestly faced up to, and then commemorated in, in a way that the whole community can participate in. The Constitution is, is a, a document that was based on racist views back in 1901. And there are provisions in it that need to be moved out for the sake of all Australians, not just for First Nations, mm -hmm. section 25 and section 51, 26. Particularly section 25, everyone says, oh, it's, it's a dormant clause, but it's there, you know, it's there. It's a matter of what the states can do if you had some really fascists running the, a state government, what they could do in terms of denying citizens of a certain race the capacity to, to vote. So it's in there, it's an indictment on us as Australians, uh, all of us. Uh, 5126 is a race power. It comes out of the thinking of the 18th century. I'm not sure what race is these days. We're human beings. We have different cultures, we have different attitudes, we have different sort of ways of doing things. But we're all human beings. I don't know whether there's, unless there's some alien that's arrived by satellite the other night. I, I don't know of another race apart from us as humans. So the concept of race is really an archaic matter. But the debates that went on at the time to establish the Constitution in 1901 were very much in fear of Asians, people from the subcontinent, people of colour, and the desire to preserve this island state or this island nation as a provenance of the uh, British heritage. So none of that's going to get lost if there was to be recognition. Uh, our institutions are entrenched. In fact, we had to as you probably realise, you know, section 44. You can't be a dual citizen. Well, isn't that a funny thing? <laughs> These people from Britain who drafted the constitution put that in there, <laughs> hey? <laughs> and some of them were caught foul of it. <laughs> so, you know, isn't that a great thing? The foresight of our founding fathers. Um, but, and because they're all men as well, they weren't women in that, in that uh, mob right. that drew it up. So there is this, um, uh, you know, if, if we could only see the humour as well as the legal, uh, you know, stodginess and meanness of non-recognition, if we could see the humour in, in, in how we'd be better off, you know, where people aren't discriminated against, they aren't treated as deficits in our society, that we do celebrate the greatness of the First Nations of this country. And it adds to our quality of, of, uh, of citizenship in the, in the region in which we live. 
You know, so uh, I, political parties have their ups and downs, but I think Ken's right. The parliament wasn't going to move on LGBTI until, until there was a private member's bill sponsored by Senator Smith and Senator Penny Wong. That actually started, a, you know, it sat there for a while, um, but gradually, once the plebiscite had been taken, you know, she's all over Red Row, but you've got to do something about it if you're in government. And maybe that's where the, the, the people might have to start continuing to push. On a fast last point, there is an interim report on the um, work that we're doing in the uh, Joint Party Committee. You can get it from the Parliament here. Uh, chapter 7 of that report has a number of questions that we're looking for answers or guidance on. We are consulting with constitutional lawyers and all sorts of other people to try and deal with the specific wordings that may or may not go into a, a, a referendum question and looking at uh, legislation that deals with the Macarata, the truth telling, agreement making as well. So we, we will report in November. Nothing will be done this parliament, I would think. Uh, so um, there will be food for thought for whomever takes uh, government up in the, in the uh, election in, uh, next year. And as Mallory said, my side of politics, we're up for the debate, discussion. We're prepared to, uh, you know, sit down with First Nations and work out the road forward around constitutional entrenchment and around legislation and around truth telling and, and agreement making uh, by the uh, Makarata. Uh, technically, we do have time for another question, but I do know that Mr. Wyatt has to leave us now. He's got a prior event in, in Perth and a plane to catch, and we, we know oh, that. A long walk. He misses it, especially with that. If you'd like to uh, join me in thanking uh, Mr. Wyatt for being with us today. Uh, we do have time for uh, another question, though. Um, it, well, it depends on how long Maybe Senator Dodson's um, answer is. Uh, so we have one up, uh, just up here. There's a microphone up there as well. Long to be short. Yes. Just on the just on the question of constitutional change, um, Aboriginal communities or nations. That some have their own Land Rights Act and, co and Constitution. So how is um, the majority of the push is coming from um, Aboriginal people who come from the missions, from the assimilation policies. So how is Aboriginal people pushing for the whole of Australia and all of the nations where they don't have mandate? to go into the Commonwealth Constitution, not another assimilation policy, mm. when they already have their constitution and land rights and you want them to rip that up so they can migrate into the Commonwealth Constitution. How is that um, self-determination? Well, I'll have a crack at some of it. I, I, uh, I'm not sure whether I'll answer it all. But the call for a voice and the recognition in the constitution uh, has come from a uh, a process uh, beginning back in 2012 um, with uh, an expert panel, with a parliamentary inquiry, with a uh, referendum council, but more recently it's come from 12 national dialogues around Australia, it may not have incorporated everyone, but around Australia, that culminated at Uluru. And out of the Uluru statement came this question of a voice. That's how people wanted to be recognised, having a voice in the Constitution, being entrenched in the Constitution. Um, it doesn't affect people's land rights, it doesn't affect their native title rights, it doesn't affect uh, their, uh, their, their sovereign position. Um, being recognised in the Constitution would simply give you the position of having standing if you ever want to enter into a treaty, for instance, with the, with the government of the Commonwealth. We know that many people in, in say, in Victoria, uh, New South Wales talking about a, a treaty process, the uh, um, Northern Territory is talking about a treaty process as well. So people's desires to be in or out of the Constitution is a matter for them, really. Thank you, Senator. That is all the time that we have uh, today. So oh, one, one very quick question. 
Um, I'll, I'll just give a quick preview of our next Senate occasional lecture on the 19th of uh, October. It's our annual Harry Evans lecture. It'll be presented by uh, my predecessor as clerk of the Senate, Dr Rosemary Lang. She'll be giving us a, a preview into the biography that she's writing of uh, Richard Baker, the first president of the Australian Senate. Uh, Dr Lang was the, uh, the clerk who provided Senator Dodson with um, a very scholarly paper about the wearing of his hat. Um, we do have one last question. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, my name is Jim Brunner, and I'm from Pinjara, um, Yanganjara people, I don't know what people we call ourselves. And I was talking before about, um, getting a bit nervous, <laughs> about, you know, coming, coming from good, strong community. So my community, Murillo and AP1N, and the, the fear and the, the threat so this thing with this constitution talk is that we, my family and immediate ordinary family and Pinyari and Kandara families, that threat is for us, our fear, is because we've already got our standing. You might know that, Dodson and Melandari. And that's why I come here to say, on behalf of my family, is that you have to not use that name, Uluru, because it's a very high name, you know? So if we can have a meeting at some point to make you really understand our status, Pitinjara, Yankanjara, Arnold's status, yeah. you know, because we have, we have a high status and we are getting really frightened because we would like everybody, First Nations in Australia, to talk a bit more about consti constitution, question, we are, we are allowed that, yeah. but we would like for people um, and your help too, to, to remove their family name, Uluru, our family name, you know? So if we can get that opportunity, you know, I'll, I'm happy to um, sit a bit more and to help you to understand that we have big fear of that, that's, our, that's the threat to us, we're losing our status. Mm. And the Queen, she acknowledges Pindjara Yanganjara people and, and we, we acknowledge her too. You know, everything in Australia always start, always start Pindjara Yanganjara and, and that's, that's, that's why. Yep. So I just wanted to say that, yeah. thank you. That's good. I, th I think, and just um, just for people who aren't aware of that, that what was just said now is really important, because the um, the when the um, delegates went to Uluru, the naming of that statement, that's what you're referring to, I came out as the Uluru statement, and that's that's an important point. That if the families there don't want that to be used anymore, then, then we've got to work out a way within the parliamentary system, but also uh, through those other voices who've been using it to respectfully listen. Yep. Thank you. you. Uh, thank you all. If you could all just uh, join me in thanking uh, the, all of our presenters today, uh, Mr Wyatt, who's uh, obviously had to go, and uh, Senators McCarthy and Senator Dotson. Thank you so much. Thank you.